Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in. My name is Cassie Riva. I'm the events coordinator at an unlikely story bookstore. Before I introduce everyone, I wanted to go over a few technical points. If you have any issues with video or audio quality, click on the help button in the upper right corner of your screen and follow the prompts. For any unresolvable issues, leave the presentation and log back in and the problem should correct itself. Any questions can be written in the question and answer box below the screen. And if you'd like to buy any of the author's books tonight, there's a green button in the lower middle part of your screen that will take you directly to our website. And when you purchase any of the author's new books tonight, you're gonna get a signed book plate while supplies last. With that said, we do a horror panel every October and it's one of my favorite events of the year. And this year I am so thrilled to introduce horror writers, Adam Caesar, Alexis Henderson, and Sean Hamill, who are going to be discussing all things horror tonight. Adam Caesar is the author of Video Night, The Summer Job, and Zero Lives Remaining. He's an avid fan of horror cinema and runs Project Black T-Shirt, a YouTube review show where he takes horror films and pairs them with reading suggestions. It has over 10,000 subscribers. Adam's terrifying new young adult book, Clown in a Cornfield, will chill your bones. I am horrified of clowns, so this, this is fun to read. Um, if you're afraid of clowns, or you know, if you like them, either way, it's gonna keep you up at night. Stephen Graham Jones, the author of Mongrels, had the best review for this book. He said, this party starts early and it does not stop until all of the bodies have hit the floor. And that made me wanna read it. Can't wait to hear more about it. Alexis Henderson grew up in one of America's most haunted cities, Savannah, Georgia, which instilled in her a lifelong love of ghost stories. Our unlikely bookseller, William, called her debut book, The Year of the Witching. Like The Handmaid's Tale, as reviewed through the dark fairy tale lens of Angela Carter, haunting and extremely atmospheric, this horror fantasy hybrid is feminist, political, and very, very spooky. Sean Hamill is the author of A Cosmology of Monsters, which just came out in paperback this year. Stephen King said this debut book brilliantly combines the mythos of H.P. Lovecraft with a contemporary story of a fa family under threat of destruction from supernatural forces. It succeeds because these are good, likable people that we root for. They could be our neighbors. Horror only works when we care for the people involved, and because we care for the Turners, their nightmare becomes ours. Hamill's prose is simple and simply beautiful. If John Iving ever wrote a horror novel, it would be something like this. I loved it and I think you will too. It's pretty cool when Stephen King reviews your debut <laughs> horror novel, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Interviewing these amazing authors tonight is our unlikely bookseller, William Carl, who reads approximately 30 books a month and whose horror writing is featured in Wicked Weird an anthology of the New England horror writers. So without further ado, Adam, Sean, Alexis, and William, thank you so much for coming out tonight, joining us, and get you up on screen. Hey. Hello. All right, Phil, I'm letting you take it away. Okay. Thank you, Cassie. <laughs> and we do happen to have copies of my books in the store if you need one. They're out of print, but I got some still. So, <laughs> out of the woods, nice. H.P. Lovecraft meets Ed Lee, and Three Days Gone, Drag Queens versus um, Gins. So <laughs> nice. if that floats your boat, we got them. But that's not about me. None of this is. This is about our wonderful horror writers. Happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween. Happy, Happy Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> My favorite time of year, um, bar none. Um, I mean, what's not to love about a holiday that's all about horror movies, dressing up, and eating candy? It's three things that I love. And so... Um, and reading the best horror fiction, I pretty much devote October to only horror fiction or thrillers if I have to. So, um, but I'm really excited to have our three authors here today. Um, I've read all three books. I can highly recommend all three books and they're totally different from each other, which is what's wonderful. It's three very different kinds of horror. Um, so what I would like to do first is let let our authors speak about their books and give kind of a re their own nutshell review and what their book is about and a little bit about them. Uh, let's start with Adam. We'll just go alphabetically. <laughs> it's like, who is it going to land on? Um, 
Hi, I'm Adam Caesar. Uh, that introduction was incredible and very kind and very nice. And um, I write horror novels, and I, uh, I, I, get, I, I do YouTube as well. Um, I've been doing this for like uh, uh, eight or nine years. I've been published since my first book came out. Um, and Clown of the Cornfield is my first young adult book, which is um, somewhat of a departure for me. But also, if you've read my stuff, and then if you read the new one, it's uh, it's not that much of a departure because it is um, it is a slasher um, and I've I've written close to slashers before and it is like the um, the subgenre in horror I kind of revere most and I feel like is also in some ways rightfully and in some ways very unrightfully the most maligned because it gets kind of written off as the most popcorny or like um, uh, somehow least literate um, but I knew. A slasher would appeal to teens, and I, or I hoped a slasher would appeal to teens, and um, I wanted to just basically uh, write like a love letter to the to the genre without um, without feeling like it's a reference fest. Without feel, it's not Scream. It's um, it's it's it reveres the format of the slasher. It doesn't reveal the slasher itself. Um, so it's and it's it's. Clown, it tells you what it is on the title. It's clown. <laughs> it's clowns in a corn. It's, cl it's a clown in a cornfield, and he's doing the murder. So that's, that's that. Awesome. I really should All practice right. that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alexis, if you could tell us about the year of the witching. Yeah. Um, so I'm Alexis, and I, I wrote this, The Year of the Witching. Um, this is my debut novel. It's a dark fantasy slash horror novel. It follows um, a young shepherdess who lives in the kind of cult commune, and one day she's lured into um, the forbidden forest that surrounds her home. And there she encounters the spirits of four dead witches who reveal some like really twisted and dark secrets about her mother and the church and everything that she thinks she knows. Um, and there's lots of blood, and there's lots of witchcraft, and it has all of my like favorite like gore gross things um yeah i put my sort of twisted heart into this book so yeah <laughs> great thank you sean can you talk about the cosmology of monsters yeah hi everybody i'm sean uh i'm originally from arlington texas but i live in the birmingham alabama area now um cosmology of monsters you know it's funny that that stephen king quote uh, where he says you know if john irving ever wrote a horror novel and we didn't coach him to say that but that's exactly what i tried to do was to take like he, those big family sagas i tried to do basically the hotel new hampshire but with monsters uh, so, you know, just a big hearted story about a family who love each other very much and run a business together, which happens to be a haunted house. But the family themselves are also haunted by supernatural entities. And the story is told by the youngest child in the family, Noah, who has an especially close relationship to one of these creatures. And so it's sort of a coming of age story, a family saga. Um, and also an homage to weird fiction. Uh, I, I would also compare mine to sort of a, a dark fantasy, like Alexis said, um, less less frightening and more um, more frightening in implication than in moment to moment horror. I would say, you know, less less scare the crap out of you, like Adam's book, and more like when you think about it a few days later, like oh, that's kind of creepy. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so I, I have to say, I, I really loved all three. Um, I read them as they came out. Um, so Cosmology actually is in paperback now. So I read that in hardback and was t uh, was talking with Jennifer McMahon actually last year at last year's horror uh, event. Um, but she's not here this year. So um, what brings us to horror? Out of all the genres in the world, why did we pick horror and why is that what we're writing? So we're going to start with Alexis this time. What so draws you to? I'm, I'm a deeply anxious person, um, and I, I think that I like to feel fear in a contained and safe space, and for me that's like horror novels and, and horror movies as well. I think that there's something um, cathartic about being able to express the fear that I'm feeling all the time, but in an environment where you're supposed to do that. Um, and so I think that that's kind of like what draws me to horror and why I stay, but um, beyond that I found that I horror helps me kind of cope with the things I'm afraid of and understand why I'm afraid of them and maybe understand why they're not so scary. Um, I think that horror is a great space for compassion and sort of understanding the experiences of things that seem different 
or freaky or strange, um, and maybe examining them through a different light. So I think those are the things that draw me to horror, and I wouldn't be surprised if others sort of feel the same. Thank you. Sean, your turn. Over to you. I mean, I would definitely uh, echo the anxiety point that Alexis brings up. Uh, I think for me, my I, I've always been drawn to the genre, and I, but I think for me, it's sort of the um, the thing that I love most about it uh, is the dark wonder it can provide. You know, I feel like Guillermo del Toro films are maybe the uh, the the poster child for this sort of thing. You know, about like beauty, but in a sort of a dark way, um, showing you that the world is bigger than you think it is and so much stranger. And mm. that's really what I love most about horror. And I think why I'm drawn more to the weird fiction end of the spectrum than maybe some of the, I mean, I love the whole genre, but that's kind of where my, my um, I guess my true north lies <laughs> as a horror fan. Adam, how about you? I think I, 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 think I agree with everything everyone said and it really occurred to me this morning i was um i was reading a, i was reading a, uh, an essay um by um uh, author pat lacy uh, my friend and he had written this beautiful essay about i guess he'd been asked like oh why do you like horror or why do you like halloween for um becky stratford's um, blog um and he'd written this beautiful essay about um basically like reading skeleton crew at the same time that his father was dying mm -hmm. um and i don't like i don't want to like speak to his experience because i that's the thing i can't speak to his experience that i have i've i haven't um endured loss like that and i haven't had uh trauma like that but he connected the two in such an interesting way and and it's similar to what alexis was saying the idea of like processing um the f you know fear and 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 uncertainty and you know like a safer like more like limited space um and I, and I was reading that and I was like, wow, I can, I can completely understand where he's coming from, but it's also just not my answer for like, why do mm -hmm. I like, are you, like my answer is very different. And I think that this genre can do, um, there's so many flavors of it. The idea that we've thrown the word, like we've thrown fan fantasy in there and it's, you know, it's, some of these books are undeniably have fantastical elements or, but are still undeniably hard and are still in the genre and weird fiction is its own genre like even though it's you know kissing cousin like um and then you really do have stuff like you know friday the 13th part three is it also in the horror genre like there's, there's there is a um a panoply of of experiences and i also like it's also when people are like oh why do you, you how do you only like watch horror movies it's like well i don't only watch horror movies like uh, i watch all kinds of films because I, I love films and I, I read all kinds of books um but i can spend uh, the length of time that I can spend immersing myself in the horror genre because there's something kind of for every thing I'm feeling or everything I'm feeling like I can reach on the shelf or reach on the bookshelf and and pull out, pull out something that is suits my mood and still is technically horror. Great, thank you. So I don't know about you guys but it feels like horror is in a renaissance of, of sorts. This year has been people are putting out the best work they've done in a long time and there's a lot of great books coming out and it's do you feel like this is happening as well um we'll start with sean uh yeah yeah i feel like horror is sort of having a moment again in the mainstream um it's been going on for a couple of years now i mean like even talking outside of books like a lot of the the TV and film projects that are getting the most attention, you know, or things that Jordan Peele is doing, you know, or um, you know, Haunting of Blind Manor, you know, uh, just hit a couple of weeks ago, and it's like a huge on Netflix. Um, so I I don't know if it's tied to how uncertain uh, things feel in the world right now. I don't know if that's if somehow we are kind of in a place where we just need it and so it's kind of having that renaissance or that's where artists tend to be thinking because we're all on sort of a darker track at the moment um i i haven't done any research to back that up but i i there's definitely something in the air and it's very exciting as a lifelong fan to see it so mainstream for the moment adam what do you think yeah, I think, I think to a certain extent, horror is cyclical. And I also think it's, I also think publishing takes a hell of a long amount of time. I don't know, I, I'm sure my uh, fellow panelists can, uh, can speak to this. So I think it's interesting that everyone, like you can draw the line to like 2020, but it's like, no, this had to have been in the works 
in like 2018, 2019, this, this kind of golden age we're going through. Like it's, it's, um, you know, talk about anxiety. Like I was trying to keep up with the, the newer book. I don't, I don't normally, I don't normally keep up with like everything that's coming out, but I was like, well, if I have a book coming out this year, I should really try to like, I, and it's, it's, it's it's never ending like my my kindle is never ending my my audible of like i bought like three more credits and i went through them like it's 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 to the point where it's like i can't consume everything and it and it's it's which is a good problem to have um but it's just <laughs> we really are in a in a golden age and it's also like you know my top three books from this year top five books from this year um like would would be the top book in any other year prior you know what i mean like that that's the that's the the embarrassment of riches we have right now so it's hey if it's cyclical i hope this this cycle lasts for a long time i'll take it yeah. alexis what do you think yeah i agree with everyone um i think there is like this ebb and flow thing with publishing where like people begin to want what they haven't had for a while or what hasn't been in for a while so i think that horror is deservedly getting its time um and i also think that there's like horror stories that are very different being published right now. I'm thinking of like Mexican Gothic. I'm thinking of movies like Sean mentioned, Jordan Peele, um, Get Out Us. And I think that there's people who maybe haven't had the chance to tell the kind of horror story they wanted to tell who are um, being given platforms right now to tell those stories and they're reaching new audiences or introducing new people um, to horror and doing that. Um, so I think that's probably a contributing factor too, but also like the, the world is kind of a mess right now. And I think that people, yeah, people turn to horror when things get messy. So I, I agree with that. I, I feel like in the 1930s, there was the whole universal thing happened when the depression was going on and ending and that kind of ended in the forties and comedies became the, the new cycle. And then, then like at the late sixties, early seventies with the Vietnam war and uh, the civil rights movement, and we were, um, you know, we were getting a plethora of riches then too, with like Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist and the other all coming out within like a year of each other or so. And then the films coming out staggered more, but um, it's, it, and I feel like, and then there was the eighties where it was just like every single thing in the whole world was horror. And then <laughs> it stopped for a while, it came back. Um, maybe some of this is politically based and interestingly enough after reading all three of your books i found politics to be actually in each of your books in some manner so like um sean yours does deal quite a bit with like mental health issues and how um mental health is viewed by people as an other kind of situation um as well as um you know what makes a monster in this world nowadays um adam i i know yours it's kind of the ultimate okay boomer book. <laughs> and so it, it deals with generational misunderstanding and how class structure doesn't always connect. Um, and then <laughs> the year of the witching. Wow. So you have, I mean, you've got some very pointed barbs towards racism, misogyny, LGBTQ issues, religious hypocrisy. So, well, was this intentional or is it just part of the story as it came to be? So this time we're gonna start with Adam. Oh, oh good. <laughs> Hard one. Um, the OK Boomer, the, um, <laughs> speaking of how long things take, but OK Boomer, like when we were in our, like, um, like I think we had like a finished PDF at that point. Um, like, oh, the thing, and, 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 and my, my editor's just like, okay, Boomer, can you believe that this is a meme? Like, should we, should we put it in the book? Like I was getting phone calls, like, can you do a quick revision to put the word, okay, Boomer in the book? And, and, and this is, I, I absolutely love everyone I was on the phone with, but the, my, my defense was if the book so clearly says is the right. okay ultimate okay boomer book i don't think i need to rush in and put a line in there that like beats it or that shows you that like so that was my that was my argument for not doing that um i think it just also you know uh, a lot of these things are uh, tipping points or boiling points of of uh ubiquity like when you distill something into a term like okay boomer or you distill something into a term like it deals with it deals with current day politics, but in a very uh, try to come in at the side way, even though there's one very loaded term that gets used in the book that is kind of a spoiler, so I'm not going to use it, but it, it gets used a lot. Uh, maybe around November 3rd, there will be people talking about it. But um, the like, it's not a, 
as, as overtly political as the book can read to someone who is um, reading it as overtly political. I think there are plenty of readers who have not gleaned onto that portion of it or just think about it more generally as about uh, generational divide. And, um, and it's, I think both readings are equally valid is my, is I'm, I'm very much a, I'm not a fan of books that are didactic. Um, I'm a fan of books that are thematically dense and present ideas and, and, and maybe have points of view. Cause I don't, I also think like the idea of like both sides is kind of a little bit, uh, intellectually cowardly, but I do think that, um, the book clearly has a point of view, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. And I hope the book is not telling you what it is too broadly, or you're not going to enjoy kids getting their heads knocked off with circular sauce. Like, <laughs> like so, yeah. that's, that's, I don't know. That was, that was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Sean. Um, um, I, so for me, I, 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 I I wouldn't say that I approached, I mean, mental illness is a huge part of the book. Um, like it, it's it's part of the book's DNA and I, it, it came to the book very naturally. It, it didn't come out of a desire to necessarily say something uh, politically, although I'm glad that so many readers have glommed onto that and seen that. What I was doing, I guess, was trying to reflect a lot of my own experiences um, coming from a family uh, with a lot of mental health problems and wanting to sort of explore that and what it felt to live with that day to day. Um, and, you know, the, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that it's been such a talking point for the book because to me, it was just part of the story I was telling, right? It wasn't like Adam said, didactic about like, look at how, what a problem this is, or we need to be more humane. It's more just like, this is what it's like to live this way you know, with this particular illness or to be someone who loves someone with this particular illness. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, and and then all of that subtext about monstrousness and everything, like it, it wasn't anything I came to consciously. It was like all this wonderful, you know, under the surface gelling that ended up happening in revision and editing where it all kind of like came together and there's a moment of like, oh, I'm saying something here, <laughs> you know? Um, so I'm really happy with how it came out, uh, but I, I can't claim to have been on top of that the entire time necessarily. Okay. Thank you. Alexis? So um, I, I don't outline my books. <laughs> like I'm a bit of a chaotic drafter. So when I wrote <laughs> The Year of the Witching, I, it was really like a manual was holding my hand, just kind of dragging me through this horrifically messed up world. And I was just kind of there for the ride. So it wasn't until I like, reached the end of the book that I kind of looked back at what I had done. And I was like, oh, this is kind of messed up. And like, here are the themes that I'm seeing. And then I had to refine that later and edit so much like Sean kind of talked about doing the same thing. I think that's quite common where you don't realize the themes that are really present in your book until you've taken a step back and sort of edit it or, or someone tells you oh, this is what they see. Um, so that was sort of my experience with the Year of the Witching, which is weird because I do think it's inherently sort of a political book and it does deal with like these broad giant issues of like systematic oppression and all this stuff. But when I was um, writing it, I was so firmly rooted in the perspective of my main character that I don't think that she realized how terrible her world was and like the larger issues at play um, until kind of like the ending of the book, she didn't have a full idea. And so because I was seeing everything through her eyes, I also didn't. Um, and I think that made the writing process seem more organic to me and hopefully the story seem more organic too. Um, because it was interesting just to kind of live the experience of the story as opposed to going into it knowing that I was writing a book about, you know, blank feminism or racism or religious abuse or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we have a question from a different Adam, Adam Albright, who wants to know how many drafts do you guys go through during the rewrite process? <laughs> ah! <laughs> um, let's start with Alexis on this one. I don't know. Too many to count. <laughs> so embarrassing to even, but like really too many to count. I think, I mean, maybe 10 ish. Okay. Um, I, it depends on when you, I guess, look at when the rewriting process starts, because for me, I count like every single draft, but for the year of the wishing, I think there was at least 10 drafts or 10 rounds of edits or something like that. I mean, yeah, um, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sean. 
Um, so for cosmology, I think what's published is probably the 13th draft, but I, I consider something a draft even if I just took out one scene, you know? So like in some cases, there are huge changes between drafts and in other cases, it's like this one scene isn't in there. But um, I think what sold was like the seventh or eighth draft. So I did another like five with my editor over the course of a year. Um, it, you know, and uh, a lot of that was fine tuning, but um, helpful fine tuning. I mean, the first draft of the book was like 220,000 words and the published version is just over 100,000 words. So, and, and it moves wow. like a freight train. Like I, I, I think we got it, you know, where it needed to be, but it took a while. <laughs> Ouch. How about you, Adam? Well, my, my answer is kind of variable because um, I come from um, the indie press and the small press and the medium press, um, which all my first books were. My first book was with uh, Sam Hain, uh, Sam, Sal Wayne uh, Publishing, which wasn't around for all that long, has now kind of morphed into um, Flame Tree Press um, because it has the same editor. Um, uh, like, and, I, and I had a number of books with small presses and stuff like that. And I... I very much was working from kind of the pulp style of like not, not, not all that many drafts, but I also um, I take great pride in my work and I, I am incredibly, I, I, my first drafts are always more like fourth or fifth drafts because I'm uh, constantly revising as I draft. Um, I, I pretty much always am taking passes on, on material as I'm drafting new material. So uh, I, I, that was kind of, uh, that's kind of a holdover from the, the indie days. And um, with this, it was a very different process. And it was actually not entirely a, a bad process. Um, I, I kind of enjoyed the being challenged and being like, you know, let's have a discussion about this, this, and this, and then, and then kind of best idea winning and, and going back to the, to the drawing board. And, and, and like Sean said, there, there, there were many, there was probably a similar number of drafts for mine and mine's, mine's a shorter book. Um, but there, there were significant kind of like alternate universe versions uh, of Clown that were very different. Uh, but I, the, the best one got published, so. <laughs> we have another question. So um, we have from Jonah. He wants, he knows, he says, Adam, a movie of Clown on a court field was proposed. Is there any news on that? And I'm just going to open it up totally to everybody. We'll start with Adam. Is there a film version of it coming? Uh, yes, hopefully. Um, so uh, Temple Hill, uh, who did um, a number of, they did uh, recently, they did the Mr. Mercedes TV show and uh, the Outsider uh, TV show. They were producers on that. And they've, they've done a ton of um, YA adaptation. They've done the, the Hate You Give and, and Twilight and all that. So they're, nice. They are well versed in this space. Um, and they have, uh, oh, I guess I don't know how what I'm supposed to say, how much I'm supposed to say, but it, I, they have a script, and it's, it was, oh, it's yes, they're, so they're they're being pretty aggressive with it, and I, um, yeah. So, okay. are you involved in it at all in the process, or is it uh, other than beyond phone calls? Not really, and okay. beyond like beyond like being like slightly more fanboyish and like uh, knowing like. I, I, I studied film in college, so I want to be like, oh, I know what I'm doing, but I don't really. But like, you know, like you get on the, the phone with Hollywood people and I just like ask more questions. And they, so the, beyond that, beyond me asking questions and being annoying, no, no that's my involvement. <laughs> my involvement is official annoyer, um, <laughs> executive in charge of annoyance. That's, that's what, uh, but fingers okay. crossed, fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll movie. all cross our fingers. Yeah. How about Alexis? Does, has anyone? bought the options yet or not yet and oh. i i have a uh i have a strict policy with all things with like publishing submission film which is that i i tell my agents like don't tell me anything unless it's like concrete good news <laughs> so i wish i could say that i know like what's happening on the film end um I, I, I get, sometimes I get little tidbits, like you'll see someone follow someone or something like that on Twitter. And I'm like, oh, who, who is this person? And then I ask my agent and my agent knows like what I do and don't want to know. <laughs> and like, so uh, even if I pry him for details, he's like, I know that you don't want to know. It's just going to make you stressed out. And he's right. It's true. So I don't, I probably know the least of like everyone on my, on that end of my team as to what's going on. Um, but <laughs> peace of mind is important. So. <laughs> I see Neil Jordan directing it. I get a very distinct 
Company of Wolves Ooh. vibe sometimes in your book, and I can see that so totally. Oh, I'd be honored. Beautiful, disgusting, bloody, and wonderful. So, <laughs> same time. Sean, has you had any? Yeah, well, there. so the rights were optioned um, by a company. I don't know if I'm allowed, how much I'm allowed to talk about it. They don't have the option anymore. We got like this close to TV. Uh, I got to read a real, I got to read the pilot script. I know that they came like within a round or two at two different networks, I think like Showtime and Stars, and then ultimately ended up passing. So now we're kind of talking about maybe doing it for film, but those conversations are just starting. It was kind of heartbreaking because the script, the, the director, the writer that they got was somebody who I really loved and the script was like, it was such a cool, it was so cool to see what somebody else did with it to like, it felt like my book, but for TV in a way that could go for more than one season, if that makes sense. Like it felt like they rebuilt it into an engine that could run for years. Um, and I'm really sad that obviously that didn't end up happening, but you know, the, the book is still young, so who knows? <laughs> it is, I, I went through a heartbreaking thing with the, my very first novel where it made it all the way to right before production and then <sighs> no. Everything went to the toilet. So, so from but now on, I'm stay there. So, buy the books and read the books. The books can stay forever. Yes, yes. That's true. That's true. Still, they got a print, unfortunately, but we'll, we're working on getting them back in. Um, so, one person wants to know um, Do we have a favorite horror novel by a female author? It can be classic, it can be contemporary. So, this time we'll start with Sean. Yeah, well, um, Favorite is hard, um, but I can talk about. Um, I mean, because the obviously the obvious one is Haunting of Hill House, right? Yep. Uh, that's. <laughs> but so, but I'd like to talk, I guess, about a couple of recent ones from the last year that I really liked. Uh, I really loved uh, Bunny by Mona Awad, uh, The Return by Rachel Harrison, um, and uh, The Ancestor by Danielle Trussoni, which I guess might be a little more gothic than horror, but I really loved it. Um, it so the, it's, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, they're they're all really good, and I'm very excited to read Alexis's book, which I finally got on back order from the publisher. So <laughs> I'm sure it'll join the list too. Thank you. Adam, we'll try you next. He took he took my answer. Well, I, uh, Rachel Harrison's book is I I love that book. I want to give the elevator pitch for it because it's so good. It's like uh, uh um, it's it also like I want more people to read this book because it like also like. Um, it gave me such anxiety um, about like what your friends think of you and if your friends really <laughs> like you and if your friends are really your friends, which is such a specific fear. But it was like I was reading it and I got to I got to actually talk with her because she does like a, a podcast and I got to talk with her like after the fact. And I, I brought this up with her and I was like, uh, we found out we were like very similar in age and had like gone to school in the same place. So like it, it made sense. It made complete sense that I was like the anxiety this keys into is exact um <laughs> and, and then it also has like a bunch of body horror and like gross teeth stuff and stuff too so it's like it's, it's for something for everyone but um yeah uh yeah, college friends they're all kind of drifting apart and like are all at different stages in their lives and then one of them goes missing like without a trace and then mysteriously shows up two years later and they try to like have like a girls weekend to like kind of get back together and like understand the trauma of like of like where she went and whether it was like supernatural or not and stuff like that. And it's, it's really, really good. Um, that's, that's a good book. And the hotel they're staying in is so weird. Yeah. That's a whole, whole part of it. It, it, yeah. it feels really lived. It feels like a real, like, like a cat skills kind of like thing that you would go that you'd find online, like Yelp reviews of and actually go to It's like, she like describes this hotel, but it's not super connected. It's not super connected to like the main plot. It's got this whole, it's very good. Yes. Alexis. I have to jump on the Rachel Harrison train too. I love that book. And I, I think I met with her and I, I, and I was like, I, I, I think that she's so smart and she's so kind and she's so thoughtful and I will read every single book that she writes. Like I would read her grocery list, honestly. <laughs> Wildly talented. So I have to jump on that train. I also really like um, Wilder Girls um, by Rory Powers. It's, I mean, it's just so, it's so beautiful. And I don't think I've read anything like it. Um, what other ones? I think I, I'm a huge fan of The Handmaid's Tale, and I know it's not horror, but it's the most one of the most horrific yes, things is. I've ever read. So, it's so scary. I, I, 
I would have to say on mine, I, I just read a contemporary one that I, that just came out called um, Plain Bad Heroines by Emily Davenport, which is just, if it can be charming and horrific at the same exact sentence, there's, there's a Rhode Island girls school that's under a curse and the girls keep dying from yellow jackets and things associated with that and then there's suicides so it has that story going on in 1902 and then a current story where there's a lesbian celebrity a la Kristen Stewart who is like producing and starring in this film and she gets a lesbian screenwriter who wrote the novel that it's based on and a co-star who's bisexual and things start to happen when they go to the original school and it's very barbed towards Hollywood and towards like gender politics. Um, but at the same time, it's it's like creepy as hell. It was so scary. Um, what is this called? Then, it's, it's called Plain Bad Heroine. I'm gonna write this down. Just yeah, very delightful. <laughs> and, uh, and there's even little cute little pictures that are kind of like the antithesis of what's happening because it's not cute and it's horrible. And there's these adorable little pictures. Um, and if, as for going back a little bit, it's like, well, yeah, we want to do Shirley Jackson. We'll all give the nod to Shirley Jackson. But Elizabeth Massey's Why Are Mesh Mothers broke me. It was one of those books that just uh, hurt so badly to read. <laughs> um, but it's also beautifully written and very fast moving and scary. But there's so much there about being a mother and what that entails. Um, it, it was it was gorgeous. So. Oh. Can I give one more shout out to another yes. one? I, I, uh, it's a um, small press, uh, S.P. Miskowski, I Wish I Was Like You. It's a grunge era ghost story. Um, I won't say much more about it than that, but I mean, it, the writing is incredible and it's one of the best books I've ever read. Um, basically this, this dead woman trying to investigate her own death but also dealing with her own like weird adolescence in seattle in like the 80s and 90s and uh so it's sort of like uh cameron crowe's singles but you know with with sort of a, a horror twist to it um I, I i highly recommend it uh every chance i get um it deserves all the praise in the world wow oh uh, okay so that was Tracy Robinson's question, by the way. Tracy's a, a prodigious reader and one of the best people in the world. So, <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Um, so, what authors or films influenced you in the past? What are what are your influences? If we're going to go back that way, uh, we'll start with Alexis this time. Um, so I don't know why I just blanked out, and the only thing that like. <laughs> rose in my head with Little House of the Prairie. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 nice. really, I, liked, I liked period pieces as a kid. And, and by that, I mean, my mom really liked period pieces. And so she would sit me down with her and we would watch the PC <laughs> version of Pride and Prejudice and to the point where like, I can still quote it to this day. Um, so those things were kind of fundamental for me. But unlike my mom, I had this kind of like darker horror side, which I think I got from my dad. Um, so I would also be interested in movies like, you know, Carrie um, and of course the book Carrie too. I have like what is very close to a first edition of Carrie that I got randomly um, from Amazon. I got really lucky. But anyway, um, those are kind of like the two influences, like, yeah, like period pieces, like old BBC period pieces and like all the classic stuff, Little Women, and then just my interest and fascination with all the dark things, gore and horror and witches. Um, when I grew older, I really got into like Nancy Drew and I, I went from Nancy Drew directly to the girl with the dragon tattoo. Um, <laughs> and so I feel like, yeah, like reading all this like really dark, horrific stuff at like probably too young of an age, um, really sort of, yeah, I got my gears turning, so. Eight. Sean. I mean, the cliche answer, well, I guess the universal horror movies, uh, I used to watch those every Friday night on AMC when I was a kid um, at, with my dad. So I think that's probably where it started that and the Alvin Schwartz scary stories books, which of course they made a movie of what, last year, two years ago, um, are kind of what got me started. And then, you know, in junior high, like probably most horror fans, somebody passed me a Stephen King book and I was on that train for a long time. Uh, Anne Rice was a big uh, awakening for me, theologically, sexually, uh, you know, a lot of that. Um, and I still I, I, I still return to, you know, some of her stuff. Um, 
and reread it every now and then because I I think her best work is so like dense and gothic and and uh, you know so different from the rest of the horror pack in so many ways. Um, and then you know. Um, I think movies had more to do with it than, than books, though, aside from Stephen King. It took me a long time to figure out where to find um, good horror, you know, um, in the smaller press as the indies and then the recent sort of boom that we've had. Um, so David Lynch was big. John Carpenter was big, you know, for me as a, as a younger person. Uh, I was just the right age for Donnie Darko when it came out. So, like, uh, you know, <laughs> I think that sort of, is, for better or worse, is sort of etched on the side of my brain, like every frame of that film. Um, so I, that's kind of where, yeah, my influences probably are. Adam? Similar, where I I, um, I grew up in a house that prized reading, um, so I was always kind of a reader. But I think horror reading came a little bit later than um, than just horror movies and the the video rental section at the at the supermarket when I was a kid, and like loving just the aesthetic pleasures of like being scared of looking at something and like that kind of thing and just wondering what those movies were like. And then, and then at a much younger and I probably should have aged, like getting to, getting to find out, um, like, to the, like to the point where I'm now like, I've kind of, I've entered the, I've entered the phase of aging where I'm starting to forget uh, a bunch of stuff. Uh, so I like, I'm now like, I've seen that movie, you know, but I saw it when I was eight or so when I was, you know, that doesn't really count. It doesn't, you know, like, so now I'm like rewatching things that I've like, that I've seen, that I've seen when I was, you know, a, a preteen. I, I've just been rewatching um, Cronenberg from be from the beginning because the, the new Shivers Blu-ray just came out. And I, I don't, I'm like, I'm applying for Canadian citizenship as we speak. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, I like that, like Cronenberg and, 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 and uh, Craven and Carpenter and, um, yeah, I'm a big fan. I'm a big Roger Corman fan. I'm a big, um, I'm a big fan of things that are generally lowbrow, but I'm like uh, a pretentious guy, so I like read into everything and like was a film major, so I like I, I really do like to look at things um, in a in a way that I'm like I'm I'm not just trying to distance myself. Uh, I, I definitely don't fit into the like Mystery Science Theater 3000, um, so bad it's good. Um, mindset of uh, watching uh, lower budgeted or trash horror films. Like I, I try to, <laughs> I try to, like I try to um, meet them on their own level in a certain, to a certain extent, and enjoy myself. Um, and then reading, um, so I like, I like the way that Sean said, like couldn't quite find, like it takes a little while to like, you know, you, you like, you go from Anne Rice to you go to these like the the books that are all in the bookstore that 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 each author has a has their own shelf. And then you get to the to the smaller shelves and the smaller shelves and then the, the special orders and then to the used bookshops and then to the like that's how it kind of that's like the daisy chain that it follows of like, you know, from King you go to like everything that's mentioned in Dance Macabre and you go to like Matheson and then you go to like you go to your your Shirley Jacksons or your um, Poppy C. Brights or your Joe Lansdales. Like it, it, it's it is it is such a journey. Um, and and now I feel like I kind of envy anyone younger than us who who has the internet and has that kind of resource of like just go to like the stub on Wikipedia and it's like there's like a reading list and everything's digitized and it's like you don't have to you don't have to hunt anymore. Which is I think some people. Um, at least in the film community, Susan, like the I had this on the the duplicated VHS. You know, it used to be such a it used to be such a gatekeeping thing and such a like where'd you get this car? Oh, well, it was from the Hellraiser two, and someone told me about the Doctor scene in Hellraiser two. Like, it, there's none of that bullshit anymore. It's just like what do you what do you enjoy, and you can immediately go find it, which is great. I think it's a I think it's a good thing. Um, Okay. That's right. I, I don't know. I, with me, I was influenced young. I, w I grew up in the country, and I mean, in rural Ohio, it was cows, 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 <laughs> corn, 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 maybe a clown, me over here. <laughs> um, and it was just, it was like very lonely and very quiet. So I read constantly, and I hooked on the trash horror early. And luckily, my parents were of the kind that said, you'll know if you shouldn't be reading this, which... <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, so probably my biggest influence that I learned back then was Peter Straub, who I discovered through Ghost Story, which is still possibly my favorite horror novel that I've ever read. 
and um, Shirley Conran, who wrote Lace, which is this horribly trashy book that's just a complete and utter delight that they made into a really fun mini series with Phoebe Cates and Angela Lansbury and Brooke mm. Adams. And it's, it's just, it's utterly trashy and knows it's utterly trashy and it goes for it. And it's just so fun that you forgive it anything. <laughs> so, and, and Phoebe Cates, I'll forgive anything too. So, but uh, it was, that was, you know, the countryside was dark and spooky and we already had that. So, I kind of uh, went towards it, and seeing Halloween in the fifth grade probably wasn't the best movie <laughs> of all time. Um, I wasn't allowed to see another rated R movie for years, but it was, <laughs> but I had a good one to start with, so uh, that was great. Um, so talking about Halloween, this is Halloween season, so the most important possible question of the night. Candy corn, is it satanic and evil or is it delicious? <laughs> Adam. Oh, you're starting candy yeah. corn is great. I really? love candy corn. And I will and I and I'm and I'm sorry. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, but I love it. I don't know. It's it, it gets thrown in with circus peanuts. People say it in the same breath, and I don't understand yeah. that. I, I, I love I love candy corn. Okay. John? Yeah, I, I have a bag of it in the kitchen. I'm gonna eat some of it after we get off this. <laughs> <laughs> this panel. Um, I got the special autumn mix that has little pumpkins in it and everything. Oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very excited about it. <laughs> Alexis? Yeah, um, I hate candy corn. I think it, <laughs> it triggers my gag reflex. I think it's like the nastiest thing ever. When I, people eat it, I feel like my eye twitches. <laughs> but I can't sit here and be pretentious because I will eat anything that has pumpkin spice on it i'm ba i'm i'm super <laughs> not to like absolve me of, of embarrassing food decisions because yeah. <laughs> like i've chugged so many pumpkin spice bullcrap concoctions at this point that i i can't stand here on my soapbox and say really anything about candy corn <laughs> Oh, I'm with you. <laughs> so I don't like it either. But I'm, I can eat pumpkin anything. Uh, I come from a place called Circleville, Ohio, which has this thing called the Pumpkin Festival. Every year, over 100,000 people come to this thing. It's insane. And it's every kind of pumpkin food you can imagine. And pumpkin hamburgers, pumpkin chili, pumpkin. It's nuts. And, uh, and I just used to eat my way through the whole thing. So but no candy corn, no. So, I'm on the satanic side. Um, did anybody here ever have an actual supernatural experience? Something scary that happened? Oh, Alexa is nodding heavily. We're going to her first. So. <laughs> what happened? Um, so when I was uh, little, really, really young, like three or four, um, I, at nighttime, I would be visited by this older woman who was like really nice to me. And she would ask me like how my day was. I, I was in kindergarten at the time, I think. So maybe not three or four, a little bit older, maybe like how old are kids in kindergarten? Like five, five or six. I don't know. I, I don't have children. Um, <laughs> but anyway, she would ask me like how my day was going in kindergarten and all of these like things. And she would talk to me and she knew the name of my doll, even though I never introduced them. So she'd ask how Sarah was doing. And she was really, really kind to me. And I would just see her kind of hanging out in my room at nighttime. Um, and I think I would tell my mom, like, oh, this lady comes and sees me at night. Um, and I loved it. She was like my friend. Um, and so one day I went to my grandmother's house and my grandma takes this photo out um, and she, she hands me this picture in a frame. And she's like, um, this is your great grandmother. And I was like, oh yeah, I know, I, I see her at night. I see her at night. I talked to her. <laughs> <laughs> What? Um, and 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 it was the thing. I, I don't know what happened. Eventually, she she stopped coming around. But what did happen was that um, we found a picture of her when she was like, I think in her early twenties, maybe maybe her late teens. And as it turns out, we have the same face essentially. Like we look like we honestly could pass close, like almost twins. Um, and so I don't know what that's about, but she was wonderful. Um, and I think this is why like. I'm a little scared of ghosts, but my ghostly encounters have always been like so nice and <laughs> kind of boring and simplistic. Um, <laughs> and so I just feel like, yeah, it was a nice, it was a nice little experience. Wow. Adam was nodding too, I noticed. You no, I was nodding at that story. Oh. And I, I can't, I have nothing that can touch that. I saw a ghost feet one time. That's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, wait, 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 okay, we're going further on this one. 
it was <laughs> I, I literally was hooking up, a, <laughs> was, was up a, a TV at a friend's house in his basement. It's funny because I've never told this story until I started doing like promotion for this, and this became like a question. Um, but I like I remember it was maybe middle school, but I was I was hooking up an Atari, and uh, the only TV in my friend's house that could that was old enough to hook up the Atari um, was the one in the basement. So I'm in the basement, and um, my friend like did not want to. He wanted no part of this because I bought this Atari at like a yard sale. And he's like, "What's wrong with you?" And I'm just trying to hook it up to his TV. And I think that he's like pranking me. Like I think he's like down in the basement with me. And I and I and I turn around real quick to try to like catch him, like trying to prank me. And I just see feet. I just see all I can remember seeing is socks feet like run into the bathroom because it's a finished basement. So run into the bathroom. And then I chase him, what I think is him, and I like rip open the door and I'm like, ha. Uh, but there's no one in the bathroom. And then I run upstairs thinking that like he has some kind of secret way like it's, it's a house on the island that doesn't have like a dumb waiter or anything he doesn't he had no way of getting up to the, to the second or to the, to the first floor so i run up and he's eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich his mom just made him and his mom's there too and i'm just like were you down in the basement he's like nope no one was down in the basement and that's that's my ghost feet <laughs> wow i like, I like it. your great grandmother's better <laughs> no, I, know, I like ghost feet a lot i think it's fun <laughs> Sean, anything creepy in your past? I mean, creepy, sure. Supernatural, uh, no, <laughs> unfortunately. So if there are any ghosts in the crowd tonight, please feel free to come haunt me. So I've got a story to tell next time. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. I'm he let it in. It. That's how it starts. <laughs> <laughs> I saw hosts. I know. I would that love would to have your... a supernatural experience, but I've never never actually had anything uh i think that's part of why i write what i write is because like it's i would love to have that experience uh, yeah okay um we had another question from the audience about um the okay feelings towards so we have a douglas winter quote um douglas winter been writing a long time fabulous editor um uh, I've known him for, from Nikon for years, and the quote is, the problem is that horror is not a genre, it's an emotion. Horror is not a kind of fiction, it's a progressive form of fiction that continually evolves to meet the fears and anxiety of its times. To me, that kind of reflects back to what we were saying about the politics of the times and the things that are going on and why it's popular at times, but anyone have any thoughts on that? Nope. That's a great quote. I don't know if I can, anything I can say could make that quote any better. It's really, yeah. Uh, Doug would love it if she said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he gets a lot of play on the convention circuit. He does. So many, so many of, so many, I've, I've sat in the audience of so many panels where they're like, what is har? Uh, <laughs> Douglas C. Winter defines har as, which, which is a great quote, but if you sat through enough beginnings of those panels where everyone's like, uh, Steve Graham Jones walks in 10 minutes late and he's like, hey, I was supposed to be here, guys. Like, it, 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 <laughs> you've seen you've seen the beginnings of those panels enough to know. <laughs> okay. I'm kidding, Dr. Jones. I love it. Because <laughs> <laughs> we will plug right now the, the only good Indian that he wrote this year was fabulously scary. It's so what it's scary. The, the scariest best, basketball God, scene <laughs> of all time. Holy man. Uh, so... Um, that actually got to me. <laughs> yeah, there's it's, a, it's a, almost a, exactly a, exactly a third of the way through the book. There's a scene that is like, I don't know if that will ever be topped. The, that <sighs> scene, it's wild. I, 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 I had read it, it twice. I was like, I couldn't it. believe it. <laughs> yeah, and I was giggling, even though it was horrible. It was like a hor there's something <laughs> horrible happens. But I was giggling on like a on an intellectual level of like knowing what it must have been like to write that and to like sell that. And you don't really know what the book's about until that moment. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I just couldn't believe like the, the gutsiness of it and how messed up it is. Um, Easy. Um, so we're running out of time here before too long. So I wanted to, to ask, um, so Halloween, are we, what do you always do for Halloween? And is it going to be different this year? So this, I know it's very different for me because we're not doing trick or treat where I am. And, uh, it's kind of a mess, but uh, we'll start with uh, Adam this time. It started with me too much. Uh, we usually we 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 live in a uh, in a an apartment that that's a little setback from the street, 
So you basically have to do what, what I refer to as reverse trick or treating, where you bring a candy bowl outside and like you find the trick or treaters and you're like, believe me, this is my house, but here, have some. Um, so we're not gonna we're not gonna do that this year. Um, I watch horror movies every other day of the year, so I'll probably continue that trend. I actually have a friend who in October refuses to watch one horror movie until the night of the 31st and then he watches them. It's so he watches too many the rest of the year. I like I'm doubling what I watch normally this year. It's crazy, uh, Sean. You know I um, it's been a this will be my first year. Like I've been living in the woods for the past few years, so I haven't had any trick or treaters. So I don't know if I'll have any this year since you know with COVID and everything. Maybe I should get some candy just in case. Um, but usually, you know, nothing, nothing super, uh, special. I don't, I'm not uh, weirdly enough, you know, if you read my book, like I don't, I'm not big into wearing costumes or anything like that. Um, I usually, I just end up watching, you know, uh, I try to watch, uh, at least two horror movies, uh, at least one I've seen before and one I haven't. So I don't, I haven't decided what those are going to be. Halloween, you know, is the usual favorite of course, but, uh. I don't know what the new one's going to be. I haven't decided yet. There's a lot of good stuff on Shutter I haven't gotten to. So, um. have you watched Lady in White? No. Perfect Halloween movie for if you've never seen it. It's a okay. great ghost story. Sold. <laughs> Spooky and very nostalgic. So, Lady in White. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Alexis. Uh, I don't know if I have any like Halloween traditions. I do something kind of different every year. Um, one year, one of my favorite years, I, I procured some like fake blood and I pranked my little sister. And I, I had forgotten at the time that she faints at the sight of blood, so she like collapsed. <laughs> and I felt really bad. Um, but she's she not with me this year, so I can't do that. Um, I, I think that what I'm going to do is watch horror movies, of course, it's a given. Um, I'll probably buy Halloween candy so that I can eat it when no trick or treaters yes. come. Um, and then sense. I, the one thing I do every single year is I get those Pillsbury like pumpkin cookies. Um, oh, they're the exact same ones that they, ha they have like December, like the, tri like the Christmas tree ones, but I swear they taste different. Like to me, they're different. <laughs> I know they're the exact same cookie, but they're different. And so I have to, I have to buy some of those and bake them um, before the season ends, so. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm past the party years. It used to be a party night and it was like where we would go out and it would be till four or five in the morning and it's like, yeah, that's beyond me now, so. It's going to be a quiet one, a couple of horror movies, probably. Probably eat all the candy and we've got, so. <laughs> Get a stomach ache, um, go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> that happens every year. We'll starve, our, you starve yourself through the whole day so that that candy, the calories don't count at night, so. <laughs> um, and then just to end us up here is, um, I was going to ask, is there anything that actually scares all of you? Is there one thing out there that really scares you? And we will, let's see, we'll start with Sean. Uh, yeah, any sound at the window mm. will scare really? me. Yeah, I grew up with a tree right outside my bedroom window. So it's just this constant like, <laughs> so yeah. that anytime I think there might be something touching the window, I, day or night, it just, I, I freeze up. <laughs> Alexis? Uh, spiders. I'm terrified of spiders. Uh, I had one in my bathroom yesterday, and my bathroom was connected to my room, so I just didn't go in my room at all for the rest of the day. I was just like, that's canceled. It's done. <laughs> 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 um, I, I don't know. Like, I just, I have such a fear that I can't even really kill them. So I just wait for them to disappear, and I convince myself I didn't see them after enough time has passed. So. <laughs> the bathroom is canceled. I love it. Oh my god! <laughs> Adam, anything that really scares you? Gail in the chat asks clowns, and it's funny because no, uh, not really, uh, not really. The the one thing that, that I'll say scares me because I um, I was telling you guys before we got on that um, my uh, my dog's older, and he's. Um, like he'll he'll have to go out sometimes at night because he's, he's an old guy. Um, so I'll 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 put on my shoes like usually with like no socks. Like throw on a shirt and I won't realize it's inside out or that it's my wife's like <laughs> stretching her shirt out and stuff. And I'll like just stumble out into the I'll stumble out into the streets of Philadelphia, and it's so so still. Like the idea of like that stillness 
and like mm -hmm. the weird twilight time of like, of like, wow, I'm kind of half asleep and this world exists when I'm asleep, when everyone's asleep mm -hmm. and it's very quiet and I'm walking the dog and then I'll get back in and then I'll go to sleep, but then I'll wake up and I'll remember like, oh, I was out, like I walked like 10 blocks, like completely don't remember it. And like, like don't really, like was very half asleep. That, that's, that's weirdly scary that twilight, any like that half asleep, half awake thing. And just like the no one around, that scares me. Then you'll like hear like a car like accelerate suddenly or something like that. Like that kind of thing, that freaks me out, but. Wow, that's good. Um, but I love my dog, so I'll keep walking. So. <laughs> <laughs> we do a lot for our pets. Um, so just want to go through everybody one more time and not restricting yourself to women authors, but name two books and two movies off the top of your head that you would recommend people do for Halloween this year. And we're going to start with Adam. <laughs> uh, I don't even know if I can do it. Um, Someone had mentioned Shudder, and I did like Scare Me. Um, I, I, enjoy, I really enjoyed Scare Me. Um, I can't remember what was off, what was off mic, and what, I think we were talking about that amongst yourselves. Um, and I really liked the Mortuary Collection that was just uh, on there. Oh, you know what's a really good, you know what's a movie? Top tier. And, and I feel like not a lot of people have seen this, because I'm not sure if it's streaming anywhere. But a movie called Raw. Um, it's a oh. French. It's a French film. Um, and we were talking about Cronenberg, or at least I was talking about Cronenberg before. It feels very Cronenbergian, but in a different way. And it has one of the best, and most anxiety-inducing party scenes. Um, it's about these. Um, it's about this. Um, these two sisters, and they're going to veterinary school in in, uh, in France. And like one's a, a strict vegan, and like gets a taste of 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 uh, of meat while she's in. Uh, veterinary school and it does something like during this hazing process and it does something to like awaken this craving in her and it's it's clearly about other things but i, I don't want to spoil it <laughs> but it's super awesome the, watch that on halloween night and like watch it with your non-horror like loving friends and then like and then lose a bunch of friends it's awesome <laughs> yeah, yeah, go watch raw i would have a strong stomach for that one yeah. <laughs> um alexis um, so for movies, I, I really love Midsummer. It's just pretty and it's gross, and so it's a great one. But also Ginger Snaps, which is this like yes! 90s. I love that movie so much. So I love it. It's a 90s werewolf movie. It's just, I think it's just one of like the best horror movies I've ever seen. I think it's great. I think it's an absolutely perfect film. Um, and then as far as books, probably um, Mexican Gothic, and I mentioned Wilder Girls earlier, but I just feel like those two are so good, and I think they would be good together as well. Oh, and The Return. Sorry, three, but. <laughs> Sean. Well, crap. <laughs> uh, um, okay. Um, uh, movie wise, I'm trying to think of something that hasn't already been said. Um, I'll recommend Videodrome. Something about it for me has always felt very Halloween ish. I don't know why. Maybe because it's very 80s. And since I was an 80s kid, like that's kind of where my head sits. Uh, or um, the uh, Spanish version, the counterpart to Todd Browning's Dracula is really great. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've already seen the Bela Lugosi one, it's actually a better movie, except it doesn't have Bela Lugosi in it. Uh, Book-wise, oh God, I'm trying. The only things that are running through my head are the, the ones I already mentioned. I guess, uh, okay, I can mention The Bright Lands by John Fram, which oh, yeah. also came out earlier this year and is yeah. fantastic. Uh, Oh God, uh, and that might have to do it for me for books because I'm drawing a complete blank. I didn't realize this is, I would have come with more in my back pocket. <laughs> but the, the Bright Lands is so good, you guys. You should definitely check it out. It is good. It's really different too. So, and if you like football um, or gay politics, it's, <laughs> you're gonna love this book. It's like Twin Peaks meets Friday Night Lights meets a little bit Ooh. of Sharp Objects. The Ooh. pacing in that book is utterly, like perfect it, you cannot put it down until it's over yeah um, i found it very inspiring love it or hate it you're not putting it down exactly uh, <laughs> i would have to say for for movies i'll go for lady in white for uh, for the younger crowd because it's a pg-13 it's a ghost story it's not you know gory or disgusting but it, it is it is very creepy and eerie and it's got it is Halloween to the 2000th degree, this movie. It's a little boy gets locked in a cloakroom in the 1960s and uh, of his grammar school, and he sees the ghost of a little girl, and he tries to reunite her with the mother 
that she's looking for, who is this lady in white who haunts the cliffs nearby. Mm -hmm. And it's really beautifully done by this terrific director who just never, Frank Lelogia, who did a really interesting movie called Fear No Evil in the 80s, and then kind of just disappeared after Lady in White. I don't know what happened. Um, and the other one that would be really good, I, I love the movie of um, Hell House, um, the Richard Matheson book adapted. It was beautifully done. It was the Roddy McDowell version? It's just terrific, yes. And, uh, and last night we watched The Innocents for about the 2000th time, which is... Um, 1960s adaptation of Henry James's Turn of the Screw with Deborah Carr and very creepy movie. Um, it's like that. It's like the haunting. That kind of thing scares me way worse while I'm watching it than every slasher or killer or gory anything. It it gets under my skin terrible. I don't know why. I'm not afraid of ghosts. I've never seen one, but um, uh, I'm in that group. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And then. Um, um, for books, I really, and you know, another movie that's really good is No One Sees the Symptoms, which is this really good British film by a uh, British Spanish film by the guy who made Vampires, this very erotic vampire movie. And this is, with, uh, yes, yeah. and it, Lorenz, Lorenz. Yep. yeah, and he, um, <laughs> it's Angela Pleasance, and it's two women in a house, and it's almost like a Robert Altman movie, like three women, but it's two women in a house. One of them may be a killer, or it might be the guy outside. There's a man outside, and the two women are starting this relationship. And it's 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 sexy and really scary once it gets going. But it's one of those slow burns. You got to know that going in. But that was a creepy movie. So, but um, all right. I, yes. Is, oh. I heard. I think before. we're out of time. <laughs> this is so good, Bill. I have to know because you yes. talked a lot about movies. How many horror movies have you watched? Just oh, this, this month. Month. I'm doing. I'm trying to do fifty in a month. And um, well, here's the crazy thing: is I just passed. Yesterday was thirty six. Was yesterday with the NSF. Wow. Um, in Friday the Thirteenth Part Four, which I'm working my way through that crazy set. Um, <laughs> which will probably take me the more than the month, actually, because I don't know if I can do all of those in a row. So 36 so far this month? That's too many. It's a lot of work. <laughs> That's what God It's not. Keep going, going. <laughs> no. All right. Well, if, you need a, if you need a book recommendation or a movie recommendation, William is the person to see. He is usually at our desk in the bookstore, so come on in and pick up one of these books. Smash Pop that green button. Go yes, buy click all that books. button before you sign off to watch click Adam's button. YouTube channel. Click that green button <laughs> green and button. make sure you jump on the opportunity to get a signed book plate from these really amazing authors. Um, we only get the, we only get 25 from each of them, so make sure you hop on that. Limited um, edition. Signed books make a great gift. Um, your spooky friends for Christmas, awesome. <laughs> Awesome gift. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.